All right, y'all. Welcome to the IPFS content routing work group number eight. Um, we didn't meet last time. Uh, we gave everybody a little bit of time to catch up. Everybody's preparing for IPFS thing, but this will be our last content routing work group before IPFS thing. And I think um, one good idea that we should consider since the majority of us will be in Brussels is we should have an impromptu um, content routing work group meeting while we're there, even though we're doing a lot of content routing work group calls. It'd be great to see you all in person and actually kind of go over some of this stuff together. Um, but uh, DM me if you feel like uh, that's a good idea. I'd love to catch up with y'all either way. Um, I will drop the notes in the chat for anybody that wants them. And you can follow along here. I went ahead and preliminarily put uh, some updates for the IPNI team up. While I'm running through those, uh, if you'd like to go ahead and uh, throw in any representation for your team that you have, uh, it looks like I don't think we have our, our folks from, uh, looks like Gee, you may be holding down the fort today. <laughs> but uh, if you have some updates you'd like to share with the team, we'd love to, we'd love to hear from you. I'll uh, catch you up in the meantime on where we're at with the IPNI team. Um, so we launched a, a major release over the last handful of days. Uh, we've upgraded from uh, version 5.15 to uh, .6 or actually that should be six. Maybe don't even need a zero there. But um, I put the change log here, as well as kind of um, a, an item that jumps out at me as pretty important for people to be aware of, uh, this um, API refactor. I think that's probably one of the bigger stories that comes out of uh, our um, major release. And does anybody else here from IPNI uh, feel like there are other points that really should stand out that are relevant to content routing that I should be calling out here? Hey, Lytle. All right, I'm going to keep running. Um, Lytle, just to catch you up, uh, we cut a major release for the network indexer. Uh, so IPNI is up to version six now. Um, and uh, I put a link here to uh, the API being refactored. Uh, so there's a lot of packaging that happened there that's probably relevant for folks to know about. And then uh, we're presently working on wrapping up our um, value store, being able to satisfy production queries for the double hash content. So that's kind of a big theme that uh, we're hoping to come to IPFS thing with uh, a very strong migration story that we can then share with the other um, index operators uh, to try to, you know, give them the benefit of our lessons learned, as well as uh, give them an opportunity to ask us any questions that they might have, and also to make our presentations a little livelier, since we can say this, these are things we've already done not things we're in the process of doing. It's uh, There's a lot of little bugs and challenges that come with this type of migration. So we're still wrestling with some of that, but uh, Ivan's leading the charge. And then uh, thank you, uh, Lytle, for your <laughs> comments on my uh, PR. Uh, for anyone that wasn't following, uh, I proposed a bunch of uh, language changes to the uh, IPIP337 on the basis of kind of the most recent uh, reframe updates. Um, some of the links are dead and stuff like that, but uh, Lytle kind of reminded me of uh, good operating behavior with IPIPs. We don't necessarily want to change the history on those. Maybe like a comment is more appropriate so that people can kind of see the history better um, and instead maybe just propose a change to the uh, to the links that are broken. And I'll, uh, I'll definitely follow that advice today, Lytle. Thank you for that. Um, and then likewise, we are, um, we have been 
actually we may no longer be it sounds like as of this morning um <laughs> thanks adine um we're chasing providers of uh the unretrievable sids the unretrievables uh that are being represented in uh casca dht to enable saturn lookups and uh, it sounds like we made some progress with uh infura that i hadn't quite caught um where we uh, seem to have had them resolve the bug on their end that was uh, causing this to hide from us. So uh, forward progress. We've talked a little bit in the team about um, attempting to identify or whether it's appropriate to try to identify the sources of these other um, peering connection issues that uh, are resulting in SIDS we can't find. Or, or whether or not we uh, simply just provide guidance and let the users come to us. We're still kind of working through the best way to approach that right now. Um, but um, I will pass it along to um, either Lytle or Guy if, if y'all want to provide a, just a quick update, anything that's relevant to this group. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I've upgraded the document, but I cannot see it on your screen. But yeah, anyway, I'll go ahead. Um, so on my side, I've been working on uh, refactoring the DHC and uh, planning the chain for the double hash, so working on the double hash DHC implementation. And um, a common topic with the IPFS word has been the migration to the double hash DHC. So we've set up a um, weekly call and we discuss the different possibilities for um, the migration strategy, and we want to present the details at IPFS thing to get everyone on board and let everyone know um, how the change is going to happen. That's exciting. I think we're all looking forward to that. Nice. Um, Lytle or Dean, is there anything important from the IPFS world that we should um, be aware of from a content routing perspective right now? Um, and lastly, this week we, we've been deploying uh, initial version of Graph API uh, as a part of the RIA project, and it's kind of loosely related to the content routing because we are now passing a full content path uh, to the endpoint as additional content routing hint. Um, I think that like the long term. Uh, take away from this work for the content routing will be um, figuring out how to have similar signaling capability for a situation when user is using um, a request for a subgraph. Um, kind of like request a subgraph recursively or to some depth but still pass the information about the parent content path, the information that the subgraph is part of the parent graph uh, seems to be um, <laughs> the selector uh, that is very commonly used on the web. Um, I think uh, at the end, if, if there's more, but I think that's probably the important part for this group. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I think and it's sort of right, it's sort of like a, a long standing thing, which is that um, there's a lot of in, there's a bunch of implicitness around the fact that most of our like our advertisements everywhere are, are are sort of they look like blocks. But they're parts of graphs and like, could we maybe have less of those advertisements or how do we want those things to look or when people actually start looking for things, do they should they then have to walk back up the graph so there's. There's like some of that can maybe that we can use to try and decrease the amount of stress um, from storage in in like IPNI type systems, um, but that'll come later and also comes with the flexibility that we get from the metadata field. So like that's that's a, that's something that we can we can look into later. Is that um, is that because it gives you more like dynamic capabilities to like structure queries or? Well, yeah, I mean, the, I, IPNI just has like a, a a stuff field, 
right? <clears throat> Which allows us to then experiment with what stuff should go in there as opposed to the current like DHT where there, there's no like, there's just one field, which is the peer ID, right? Um, and that, that's it. Um, the only, the other thing I can, I can think of here is um, related to some work that's been going on with uh, trying to do like service worker things in browsers to load data. Um, we've, you know, we've noticed we'll say some some like issues dealing with IKNI where we've had to like kind of punch through some of the the caching, basically because the two hundred are cached for like an hour. So um, if you like forget to turn on Web Transport and then you reboot your node and you turn on Web Transport, it like won't <laughs> it won't work for an hour for you. Um, so like like that kind of thing is is a little unfortunate. Um, probably peer routing would resolve this. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that's kind of most of it. So some of these other PRs that have been a little back burner because everyone has things to do before IPFS thing, we may need to, uh, to, <laughs> to bring back once everyone's on, uh, on home ground again. This is a good call, Dean. Thanks for... Thanks for kind of putting that thought together. Um, I, I definitely, I don't want to lose sight of that, but at the same time, like the last thing I want to do is uh, apply any pressure heat right now, just because everybody's getting ready for this event and it just doesn't seem the time for it uh, right now. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's just things that like Russell and I are going to have to hack around. Like I'll probably stand up like another routing v1 instance instead of using sandy.contact because like we can't we can't control how some of that operates um Let's... which is fine it's sort of the point of the point of these apis is that you can you can do this um but it's just you know it's like when you when you hack something together for a demo the responsible thing is to let the people upstream know what you've hacked around uh so that that they're aware that uh, that that definitely. I'm interested to hear kind of uh, feedback from the team. I'll I'll let the group say. Should we take this topic as one of our like top of minds to discuss towards the end of the meeting um, and get through the topics we've defined, or do we find this important enough to try to just jump into right away while we're kind of in the thought process? Like Will Mossy, did you did you have any feelings about this subject that we want to uh, dig into? Would it make sense to finish off the roundtable and then come back to it if, if that's okay with Eddie? Yeah, I, I would say like we we have a way of dealing with our thing in the short term. Uh, let's clear anything else that's like top of mind for people, and if we have time, then we can deal with it. Awesome. Cool. All right. And uh, I don't think, yeah, we don't have a Bifrost representation. Um, I'll check in with them. They've been providing pretty consistently updates of everything that's going on over uh, with the decentralized um, gateways uh, program. And uh, I've been kind of keeping up with them uh, regarding the state of the rollout on uh, on GitHub. but. Um, presently, my understanding is, is that V19 is rolled out uh, across all of their clusters, and that um, that includes IPNI, SID.contact, hard-coded, doesn't it? I'll get a contact. I am not sure about that. Yeah. This is, uh, I actually put an action item to validate that this is the case. From looking at GitHub, I get the impression that that is what's been merged to date, but uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and take it as an action item to ensure that that's actually the case. And uh, I will leave a note in our uh, summary um, uh, at the end of this call once I get that feedback from them. The issue is still open. And I and so in Bifrost open uh, infra, uh, which makes me assume that that is not completed. I'll double check and find out. 
um, if they haven't pushed it out to their cluster, then it'll be good to know when um, when they will. Because I think Steve pointed out that um, all of the blocking kind of challenges with the Kubo release have been resolved. So um, I'm not sure what else would potentially be holding it up. Maybe it's a procedural um, kind of like deployment pipeline type of um, process that they're going through. I'll find out. Uh, I'm sure everybody in this group will be interested in the answers to that. Um, so that's it for the team updates. Um, ah, right there at the top. <laughs> Looks like I was following my own train of thought. Um, I did uh, want to ask <clears throat> in the comments of, I'm just going to go ahead and split screen here. Um, in the comments of this issue, George posted this concern about the time to first bite um, that started back on the, the 22nd, I think. I wasn't sure if we had actually kind of resolved for like the concerns that um, the direct impact of using Sidoc contact was resulting in this or whether or not there was so so we don't have gus or george here who are the only two people who will have thoughts on this uh it, the the delegated routing framework should not increase as you add an additional parallel routing thing that was a bug in the delegated routing client code i believe gus has been working on it i believe that's why sit.contact contact is not turned on on the gateways yet got it but we need them i think to comment on where they are there I will take an action item to follow up on that. Thanks, Will. All right. And, oh, <clears throat> so we do have, um, I'll just say this for the call. Um, my question was, uh, another thing that came out of that topic of conversation is how can we track an estimated percentage of SID.contact enable network and at what point we'd be willing to um, dial down the hydras. It looked like there were a lot of questions around how much network coverage do we have to have before that's um, kind of a, an appropriate uh, action to take. But it looks like Liddell's already um, answered that question. Um, so when we talk about coverage, it breaks down into two things. One is the uh, lookup coverage, how many people are using Sita Conduct to look things up? The other one is publication coverage, how many people are publishing into Sita Conduct? Uh, for publication coverage, we crawl the Filecoin network to see how many nodes are exposing you know, the protocols. As for IPFS network, I believe the only nodes that are publishing to uh, IPNI from IPFS are the Colab clusters, uh, which Ivan integrated. Uh, for lookup coverage, uh, like uh, Liddell mentioned, the since Kubo 18, uh, seed dot contacts been integrated into Kubo. Uh, for specific numbers on that, we should look at the ratio of upgrade, of course, because not everybody is upgraded to 118. Yeah, I don't think publishing like mat matters for this because the hydras aren't helping anyone with publishes. The hydras are only helping with lookups, so it's just. Mm -hmm deciding and 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 like i guess we'll see how it goes ideally we'd have some number of like yep when x percentage are upgraded it's good to go but if it turns out that it's been like three decades and uh, there's still 20 percent of people who haven't upgraded like i think it's time right uh so like i don't think an, i think there's like a number or an amount of time or number of releases that have passed that probably let us feel comfortable doing this especially if we can accompany it with a blog post of like, yo, it happened. We hope you've all upgraded by now. You've certainly had the time. <laughs> um, that's, that's fair. No, that's totally fair. And uh, thanks for clarifying that. I wasn't, I haven't done the deep diving enough on Hydra functionality to ensure that I felt confident that um, publication coverage wasn't somehow a component in there of, of what, service they were providing. So that's good to hear. Um, that clarifies the problem for sure. <clears throat> and 
I don't like um I, I don't know that there's like pressure coming about like a timeline for um hydro drawdown, but I, I do know that it's a resource semi-intensive, you know, um service and you know, anywhere we can we can save. It seems like it's to everyone's benefit. So it seems it's also like a sneak. It's it's also like kind of a, a roundabout way of doing the thing, right? Like we're running centralized infrastructure as a bridge to other centralized infrastructure, <laughs> or or maybe you could just query that one directly, right? Um, it happens to be that it like hides within the existing decentralized infrastructure, which is what makes it easy to use. But like there. There's no reason to do that. It just adds extra latency to your query and extra infra cost for, yeah. for us. This and is, lower rely and lower reliability because the coverage isn't like a hundred percent. It's like you know, whatever, like 97% or whatever the number is. Did we get to the bottom of impact of hydro drawdown onto the uh, DHD lookup latency? What happened there? I forgot that thread. Uh, Guy. Yeah, um, so the, the, there have been multiple things happening at once, including the, um, um, an incident with a lot of unresponsive node within um, the DHT. And so the conclusion was um, that the hydras don't have a big impact, at least on the DHT which means that now they are used only for bridging. But from our observation, so again, there have been multiple events at once. So we have been predicted, uh, predicting one, one scenario. And then um, this incident happened. It is now solved. And the number we observe now uh, are what we expected before. Um, so I would say that um, we're good without the hydras. So uh, I do think like how we affect the users of the network, uh, Adeen, <laughs> this, this is a pretty important point. Uh, we definitely want to, you know, draw a fair line in the sand that doesn't just uh, stir up everyone. But um, let me iterate on this concept a little bit um, so that maybe we can have that discussion. I'll, I'll talk to Steve about it a little bit, see what his perspective is, but it would be nice if we like drew a target somewhere in time where we uh, can wrap these up. And I think we actually get a lot of benefits from pursuing that effort. And hopefully it's not too much work also. So uh, kind of a low cost, high reward type of scenario, which those are always a good place to focus a little bit of energy. Um, the Production gateways to use the index or lookup issue that uh, I put here. Um, I don't know that, uh, I think this was more of a kind of a, a Gus uh, topic, but uh, I'll pitch it out here anyway. Um, Steve was asking about whether or not there was uh, any work that needed to be done on the IPNI side to support um, this production gateway lookups occurring. And uh, our perspective was, uh, after talking about it, that there probably wasn't anything we needed to do differently. Um, however, I just wanted to follow up with uh, the whole crew here um, with, you know, does anybody have the perspective that IPNI should be doing something to support uh, these changes? Is there something that we need to kind of prepare for or do? I can't think of any unless there is some uh, something smoking that I've missed, right? Because this is all gateway sort of work. It's also sort of happening anyway because of Rhea. Yeah. Right? Uh, so like we're, we're already like 30 percenting that at the moment. Um, so it should be, should, it shouldn't have to have anything, you know, standing out on the infra side that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. I'll um I'll kind of circle circle back with um <laughs> with uh, Gus and and Steve and just kind of check in with them 
I, I don't think there's anything here, but I also want to make sure that we're not incidentally accidentally blocking or, or something like that, just because we're not aware of something they need. Um, and then <clears throat> I did catch this um, routing table health discussion in the IPFS content routing work group. Um, I think some of this discussion probably was happening. Um, it, it didn't look to me like we got ourselves to a point where everybody left probably with resolution, but I wanted to pitch here to the group. Um, is this uh, a topic that uh, we want to bring up and address? Or is this something best left for the asynchronous chatter in Slack? What do you mean exactly by this topic? Yes. Yeah. Okay, it's it's the request for measurement I've been working on. Yeah. So yeah, I'm happy anyway to discuss it. Let me grab the thread real quick. So um, this is the thread that uh, Adeen posted asking about uh, analysis or analysis tools for making sure that the DHT client implementations are functioning properly. And um, when I went through that thread, um, there's kind of like a lot of requests for support going on, but also um, kind of a lot of data that came out of that discussion. Um, but the kind of end point that I took as a summary of that discussion was, is that uh, we're going to um, kind of make an attempt to run an experiment. Um, I'm summarizing here. So we, we intend to run an experiment of routing table health kind of post this ECS migration. I hadn't heard that term before the ECS migration. I'm not sure what that is, and, um, but that we're gonna run that experiment after that event. And that's going to drive any kind of like, you know, action associated with improving DHT routing table health, um, I'm assuming. Is is that is that accurate, Guy? Does that sound right? Um, I'm not really aware of the any ECS migration or thing, but this what I can say is, is, yeah, it's a study on the routing table health that I did I think last year, and the plan of ProBlab is to set up a continuous measurement in Pro, and to replicate any measurement that we've done in the past and just continuously monitor uh, things. So that's definitely something that we plan on measuring continuously. Torfin, is this about the uh, uh, full RT measurements that uh, Adin and... Uh, Laurent, maybe? Uh, yeah. No, I forgot his name. Uh, Dennis, but then, yes. Yeah. Dennis discussed. Do you remember, Adin? It was a thread between three of yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think the idea here is like uh, we are we are the the request was to uh, ask our friends who have been doing a bunch of this measurement stuff to help 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 the boogeyman go back into the shadows, uh, which is like there's a bunch of these things where people try and they they use them and like something goes wrong and they're like, oh, I wonder if X is the problem. Uh, and the hope is that with some continuous measurement here, we will know if in fact X is the problem or if it's like something else is going on. Um, and, and that probably that investment will pay off like fairly quickly based on the number of times people, the, the amount of time people spend trying to like deal with these like unknowns. Um, so one of these is like, is the accelerated client finding all the stuff that the regular client can find? Have the parameters changed since that code was deployed right maybe mm -hmm. um things like that that will also help build confidence so that when people show up to you know 
uh, sandy.contact and, let, and they say, well, I put in cascade equals DHT and like, I'm not getting stuff. Yo, what's happening? Uh, that you can with confidence say, yeah, that's because the person didn't provide the data and not because we're having like infra measurement problems. Or even if you're not there, you could say, well, I know the full RT client should work. So let me make sure that I didn't do something similar on the, I didn't make a mistake on the infra side with caching or whatever. And that's not the problem. And then, yep, it's the provider's problem. It's it's their fault, right? Um, I think just like making sure we appropriately attribute fault was also something that came up in this discuss in the Raya discussion yesterday with uh, with Juan around like helping users understand when the reason something couldn't be found is because the person who was advertising or storing the content had a problem, as opposed to like the the protocol is slow because it's searching everybody on the internet to see if they can find your stuff um right attribute like without without being able to like attribute fault everyone kind of just makes up whoever's fault seems most convenient for them that's a that's a really good kind of point to bring forward to the group that i i think like the summary takeaway here is we'd like to be able to provide users with visibility into like where things are slow or failing, just like you might if you were trying to navigate routing issues elsewhere on web two, right? Um, Torvin, is that the same Slack thread that you referenced in the- That is the Slack thread that I was uh, referencing, Moxie. Okay. Um, the reason I called it out here is there were kind of a few varying threads there. And um, the summary takeaway that I got from it was that there was going to be a, kind of an experiment that took place as a result of this. But I wasn't sure whether or not measurements had been requested in that thread that hadn't actually been serviced. There was a lot that were provided, but uh, I thought there might also still be open questions. It looks like what we've actually got is an action item that the group's taking to build this continuous measurement system that y'all probably have had planned, uh, which is good to know about. I think that's something that'll benefit all of us. So I'm excited to hear that. Um, won't belabor that topic anymore. Uh, one thing I wanted to throw out to this group is IPF's thing is coming up. Everybody's kind of doing independent stuff, of course, but uh, you know, we're we're all kind of a big team and we're all meeting together. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, use this group as, you know, if somebody needs help with like measurements from one part of the network or the other, or is trying to prepare for a presentation and wants details, um, don't be shy to leverage the crowd specifically. If you have requests right now, like go ahead and put them out there and we'll get a list going and we can try to help each other out so that uh, we all put our best foot forward, um, but I just want to encourage everyone to use this group in that way. Did anyone have anything that they were actually kind of looking for right now that somebody from this group might be able to help with that um, they've kind of been seeking? If not, DM or drop it in the IPFS content running work group. I'll try to help coordinate with that kind of stuff as well. And then um, I just wanted to throw out there, um, I think from our perspective, auto discovery um, is potentially a very big win um, from the IPNI side of the house. And I wanted to know from everybody's perspective here, when is an appropriate time to like revisit that topic and kind of get into the guts, the design and whether or not, you know, I know Will put together this um, proposal in the past. Uh, I think maybe, I'm not sure if that was all Will or there was collaboration on it, but, um, you know, do we need to revise on that at all? Or um, how, how does this go from like an idea to um, like an IPIP or, or something? What are the next steps? Does anybody have thoughts on it? So my, yeah, the, the main thoughts I have are like the the uh, the most important part of auto discovery is that there is more than one party to discover, uh, right? And making sure that we have you know uh, have enough reliable other partners that this 
this is even like reasonable to do. Um, if we write code that does auto discovery and it discovers five five indexers, but only one of them is is like has any reasonable amount of data, and so we're just going to end up choosing say CID.contact all the time, that it feels like we could be spending effort elsewhere to grow the network rather than rather than this. What if you have those people already? Then it seems reasonable to do this. I could see people complaining maybe about uh, about stuff before the the double hash migration. Maybe people would complain about um, if they're sending their requests off to these other entities that they trust less. I'm not I'm not sure if they're going to care. Um, the the other note here though is there is a chicken and egg problem, which is it's hard to get people to pay a huge amount to maintain infrastructure that no one queries. Um, so without a mechanism by which they get some traffic and there's some value seen in providing it, you get these questions of like, well, why am I paying this monthly bill for zero traffic? When are you sending traffic to me? I'll, let, let me jump in uh, to follow Will's comment. Um, so, Adine, I really appreciate that perspective. It's not one that I think we've presently surface, but it almost seems obvious after you've after you've made it. Uh, I, I totally get that. Uh, and I'm sympathetic to that perspective for sure. Um, I'm I'm kind of working with the other index operators right now to basically kind of prepare them for the idea that you know they would be supporting this type of traffic. So we're going to have like a kind of like the storage provider worker calls something similar with um, the index operators is what I'm calling them right now. If there's a better name, please feel free to pitch it. But um, we're also this quarter, so we just finished our quarterly roadmap planning for uh, the IPNI team. Um, I'll, I'll share a link to that with folks here that are curious about it so that you can kind of get a sense of what we're trying to accomplish this quarter. But um, the big story to take away from that is monitoring and synchronizing across indexer instances, <clears throat> maintaining consistency, as well as kind of uh, some efforts towards trust and uh, I think reliability um, are all on the menu right now for things that we're hoping to accomplish. It's a bit aspirational. It's a lot of work, but uh, I think we're going to make a lot of progress with that. And so we really expect over the course of the next few months to have visibility and insight into what each of these index operators is doing. And simultaneously, I'm going to be preparing them for the concept of we're going to be like passing traffic. So, um, you know, working on this like incentive discussion with them of like, you know, how are we going to keep you online and like, what are the benefits that you get from doing this, um, making sure that we've some solid partners that are really committed to supporting this effort. So considering that timeline, then, um, uh, you know, how do we reduce the variance in our chicken and egg uh, to being as logarithmically close to one another as possible until we reach the singularity, <laughs> I well, think. So goal. one one we might be able to do, if I'm thinking like, I suspect most of the the complexity here would live probably in like the client code that figures out who who to choose, like given a few options, which ones of these are like good and which ones are bad. Um, we could probably start to experiment with this already. Um, like Massey raised this and and Will in the IPNI the PL IPNI channel earlier today or yesterday around um, the fact that there's now like a, there's a delegated DHT instance that you can query. Um, and so people might, even if they already have the ability to do DHT lookups on their machines, they might choose to ask someone else to do it if it's gonna help them out with, um, you know, performance or, or like, yeah, with either like, you know, latency or resource consumption. They might choose to do that, but they'd probably only do that if they knew it was as reliable as the running it locally. 
And so we could choose those already as like two separate routers that we compare against, which would mimic the logic that you would do for two separate IPNI instances of like, are these two effectively comparable? Um, and so we could we could maybe start with that already. Because it's not a chicken and egg thing. We already have a few versions of it. The other thought here uh, that that I think we have discussed a couple times is that using Ria slash Lassie um, as a staging ground, especially if we get caches in addition to full providers, we may find value in having Lassie discover the caches near it rather than going all the way back to a full index. So that may be another place to be able to do more controlled rollouts and gain confident in an, confidence in an algorithm of this sort of auto discovery before we. Uh, release it to a full Kubo node. Yeah, I mean, for now, like experiment, like if, if there's something to experiment with and people aren't concerned about anything related to like the double hashing privacy stuff, the fact that like if anything's ever weird, you could always just double your queries and go back to the one we've hard coded already, which is CID.contact means that like it's not so scary. Like if you get the algorithm wrong, it's not so scary because you just you just do all the work twice uh, in the worst case. That's that's a good point. <clears throat> I think we've got a hard fallback that kind of it's a safety net for sure, right? There's not like a it's not a big scenario with your hair on fire that you can't you can't roll back to easily if you've got some testing going on that goes wild. Um, let me let me summarize on this discussion a little bit and try to come up with uh, like kind of action items associated with what a path forward might look like for this. But um, I appreciate y'all's perspectives on it. I think it's it's definitely like a, a big step in the right direction if we can make a little bit of progress on auto discovery it it kind of leads us to that next place where we can start to let this thing run which is a big goal but uh would would really be great and then um Guy, did you add these items uh to topics the or did go ahead yeah i did the last item Awesome. So it's, so it's more to start the discussion or FIY. So the currently the way the provide and reprovide operation work is that the IPFS implementation, so for instance, Kubo is responsible to reprovide periodically um, the CID. So for instance, if we take the DHT. And I think that's the wrong abstraction. I think that the content routers should generally um, have an interface to um, start and stop advertising for some content because the DHT and IPNI, for instance, have totally different uh, provide or publish or advertise mechanisms. And I don't think that it is the IPFS implementation's role to care about this. So IPFS or Kubo should just call, okay, start providing this CID. And maybe after some time, we don't want to provide it anymore. Okay, stop providing it or give me the list of content that is being provided. And then each content router, I will make sure that the content is being republished if it needs to be republished or not. But so it's an, uh, an interface. So we break the interface basically. So it's a change. I think we need to coordinate before um, we commit to it. Um, but yeah, I just want to know what you guys think. Okay, you're not talking about relaxing TTL, are you? you? This is just a implementation interface, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So for instance, so I'm not really sure how the content publishing works um, with the indexers, but we probably don't want to use the same mechanism and republish every, I don't know, every 24 hours. You don't have to republish at all. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. So that's very different from the DHC. And I think we shouldn't hard code like, okay, publish once to API and every 24 hours to the DHC within Kubo. So th this is sort of something that I've been pondering about. Uh, the main difference between DHT and the indexer is in indexer, there is no TTL. And what you publish yeah, yeah. is the diff of contents in that I have this now, additionally, I no longer have this that I told you I had before, right? So the, the diff chain keeps growing. Uh, what I've been thinking about is whether something like a TTL is needed on the indexer side to accommodate a whole bunch of new uh, use cases. And the example that I often bore Torfin and folks on the IPNI team with is imagine if I wanted to publish weather information, right? There's, there's like a information that expires naturally and it changes all the time. It's a high churn information. Uh, if you want to publish that using indexer, it would probably be some somewhat noisy. Uh, people would still look up old data if my node goes down or something, probably get the wrong um, you know, measure of temperature right now in the town I'm, that I'm living in. But if you had a TTL in the indexer, uh, then, you know, it, it would basically enable you to provide something for a period of time. And then if you don't reprovide it, then it just disappears. Uh, and then the, the rationale for having this in IPNI, as well as the DHT is that in IPNI, you can provide this at scale. And if I have a, if I'm running a business that provides temperature of towns across the globe, right? Um, in terms of a scale, it makes more sense to use something like IPNI compared to the HD. Okay. I yeah, I see so not so much. Sorry, go ahead. Lee. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking it, it's not so much like um, about the fact that like it expires as much as the responsibility of who will who who cares about it expiring, right? Um, so right now you, you do sort of have, if I understand you have like, you already sort of have a TTL, not per record, but you're like, well, if you, if you don't talk to me for like a week or something, I'm just going to delete all your records and garbage collect them. Um, or at least you're allowed to do that. Right. Sort of. Yeah. Right. And so the question is like, why, you know, I have to then go through a bunch of effort to basically call the, the delete function on all my records in order that you get to save some space because it doesn't really do anything for me uh, when I do this. And so the TTL is you like, you get to shift the burden a little bit and you say, I don't believe that you're going to call the delete function on me because that's like a pain for you to manage. Um, instead, I'm going to ask, instead, I'm going to just put a TTL on you and like force you to like interact with me every so often in like a bandwidth versus storage trade-off where like I, I force you to interact with me in order to make sure I'm not wasting storage space, even if I waste some bandwidth. Yeah, I would say that's largely true. The, the only thing I would add to it is uh, in the indexer interaction, the barrier for s staying discoverable is just one connection you don't even need to provide anything right as long as you're contactable within a week that is good enough uh, whereas that's a slightly different in the issue where you need to uh, explicitly republish the information for it to appear right, right. so what i'm saying is that it's like a you're, you're choosing the the amount of work that someone needs to do to like prove that they're still viable right so like if i'm doing the weather thing what encourages me to use a ttl when I could just say store it forever. Like what like what's the incentive for me to choose one over the other? Um does that make sense? Right? Because it's basically an option I get to, I would get to set, which is like I would do, you know, IPNI dot provide and then I'd either pass a TTL or I wouldn't pass a TTL. So like why would I I guess why would I choose TTL unless unless I know I'm actively deleting the content and I'm like, yeah, that sounds like the nice thing to do. But if I misconfigure it, nothing bad happens, right? No one will let me know I've misconfigured it. I guess yeah. other than, like then there becomes like a discoverability though, right? Because you go lower down on the index and therefore it takes longer to, I mean, not really, but. 
so, so there is there are a number of complexities here which we are kind of sort of hiding in situ contact of it and that is just the cost of deletion is big you know so it's, in fact the content when it's when you call it is not actually deleted it's just hidden away and opportunistically we come to delete it whenever somebody touches that multi hash uh, and if you think about the number of multi hashes or distribution of multi hashes that are actually being queried versus the ones that are being stored then the chances are you end up with a massive amount of garbage in your data store which i'm sure we have right uh, so even explicit deletion doesn't help that right the the point of having this ttl mechanism uh, is to uh, reduce a whole bunch of complexity in the back end side when it comes to deletion right regardless of whether the client does the right thing or not because you can then uh, optimize the storage you can have uh, mechanisms to say uh, have um, what is it worst case reasoning about worst case storage that you might need in order to store information right if you like say the rate of publication of records never goes beyond this many per second in a day so if i have an expiry of a week then i can have a reasonable assumption about how much storage i need in order to run an indexer uh, in a case where the publication is forever and when deletion is so difficult such that you technically can delete then it's really difficult to reason about okay how much storage do i need if i want to run this thing for like five years i basically have to re-ingest stuff periodically to make sure there's no garbage uh, or i have to shard it you know like so would you anyway. enforce the ttl was the idea to like enforce the ttl globally or so the original idea was to provide a uh, lowest possible barrier for adoption of having ipfs nodes published directly into ipni because right now, if you want to do that, you have to have a long running process that either speaks graph sync or HTTP and it has to be publicly contactable or via some relay. Um, and then compare that to a system where uh, providing a record into IPNI is equivalent of calling provide onto uh, the DHD interface, right? You just say provide this and then it works exactly the same way. So then you open up a whole bunch of functionality or a whole bunch of opportunities for new things to be built onto the system because you have a scalable way by which you can have the same sort of time-based records that you do already provide on DHD but onto IPNI. It's an alternative routing system. That was the idea. I, I'm also conscious that I'm moving away from Guy's original question. Guy, please forgive me for stealing time and do interrupt me. Sure, no worries. But yeah, in terms of interfaces, going back to Guy's point, it would be really sweet if interfaces are flexible enough such that IPNI or DHT or routing system in general just becomes swappable and irrelevant to the client. And what, what the interface is focused on is what is it the client wants to do or enabling actual use cases for the content routing system. So we could create like um, an interface that would be, for instance, content yeah, content routing system provider that and so each content routing system needs to have one so one for dht one for the indexer and so on and we have a shared interface um on which we need to agree upon for instance it do we do it like start providing stop providing or do we do like okay provide it for like three days in the case of the weather but yeah, we need to agree on this um, common provider interface. Yep, I agree. I, I think the HTTP delegated routing is sort of doing this. You can imagine like a nested layer of delegation where when you tell it to provide, uh, it periodically calls another layer of delegation, which is provide every, uh, you know, on a periodic basis. And you essentially build the same sort of functionality. Uh, but yeah. But like in terms of interfaces, I would love the delegated routing interfaces to evolve such that we can have just swappable pieces. You know, we can experiment with different yeah. different systems. Yeah, looking forward to it too. This is a good topic to to end the meeting on. I think um, there's a lot to think about here. There's also a lot of potential. Um, I'll make sure that 
we carry this into future discussions and also that um, we summarize it and make something actionable of it so that we can make some progress towards it. Um, I really appreciate everyone joining today. These are super valuable discussions and um, it's always a pleasure. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in, uh, in Belgium that's making it there. It's gonna be a great time. Have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, folks. Bye. Take care.